This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. So get ready to rock. For example, this issue, as it often is, is a drum kit. It used to be the nightmare. How do you get a good drum sound? That's not the quest so much anymore. The quest now is how do you make the drums sound like they were a good drum sound. Sometimes the recorded performance is just a bitmap to the end result. The actual sounds used are none of the ones, and nothing else remains of the original recorded sound. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. The Spectra 1964 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. In the studio, this means that critical details from your microphone get through to your DAW. The 101 was used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon. Today, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the STX100 mic pre. Learn more at Spectra 1964. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Howdy, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Richard Dodd, a multi-platinum Grammy-winning producer, recording engineer, and mastering engineer with nearly 50 years of amazing credits to his discography. Richard has worked with a long list of artists, including Boz Skaggs, George Harrison, Roy Orbison, Wilco, Green Day, Steve Earle, Delbert, McClinton, Robert Plant, Roger Daltrey, The Traveling Wilburys, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and Freddie Mercury, to name just a few. Richard was on the podcast previously for episode 96 when we got an introduction to his background story. So on this episode, I thought we would focus a little more on mixing because we all love talking about mixing. One of the skills that Richard said he aspires to in recording is learning to stay out of the way and not screw up what the artist is wanting to create, which is great advice for all of us. With that in mind, I know Richard can be also very bold in his mixing and mastering choices. So I'm excited to learn more about his thoughts on creating compelling and memorable records and how to strike the balance in both those things. Please welcome Richard Dodd to Recording Studio Rockstars. Richard, are you ready to rock, my yes, friend? Yes, sir. I'm here. Welcome back to the show, dude. Thank you. I love your studio. It's Thanks great, very much, man. It's wonderful. great to have you over here. I feel pretty honored to have you in the in the studio. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not quite as messy as mine, but... Uh, yeah, I'm working it on it. Give I'm it working time. on my messiness. <laughs> I still have a little bit of help. I'm I'm very lucky to have interns um, join me 
Uh, sometimes I think of them as indentured friends for a semester, but uh, having somebody else around to just kind of help me stay on top of things is tremendously helpful. Yeah, I've never been able to come on board with the... the well, you uh, want to intern for me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I could. Um, but then what does it pay? Um, very little, very little. Lunch. Yeah. That's the bit I couldn't come on board with. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we could extend that to lunch, breakfast, and dinner. Who yeah. knows? <laughs> well, anyway, Richard, it's great to have you here. Um, tell us a little bit more about where you, what you've been you know, working on lately. What's, what's new in your world? Still mastering, although I was asked the other day if I would mix something. And uh, we agreed that they would send me the, the song, and I would see if I wanted to mix it. And, of course, within seconds, I'm mixing it. You know, and uh, hard not to, right? It's hard not to. And the, the the best thing of all is my wife walked in on me while I was doing it. She said, You look happy. What are you doing? <laughs> I said, What well, I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was fun. And without the pressure of knowing I had to do it and it had to be this way and had to be done by that time. I really had a ball, and I did a good job. But I declined the project because um, it would set a precedent um, that I didn't want to set. You know, the person, the artist involved, as do many artists, has a limited budget. Yeah. And I had a choice of either doing it for free or not doing it. I was tempted to do it for free, but um, I decided to pass. I wish I had done it now because I just had a go at mastering it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. How did you decide to mix it? So you were you were um, sitting down to mix this thing. I know you have experience in pretty much every form of recording, all the tools and stuff. Um, what, what did you opt for as, a, as some of the tools to use? What was in front of me? Um. I like to know what I'm capable of still, if still is relevant. And um, I've always set myself little challenges, even when uh, I wasn't long in the tooth. I was afraid of becoming what I see, had seen a lot of, of successful people doing a great thing, but doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. and um, as much as I like what they're doing and I don't want them to change I didn't want to be like that so I would do sessions projects where I would uh, not allow myself to use any of the outboard equipment that I typically use you know my go to this was a no go yeah. And um, it takes you right back to my early days where all you had was what was in front of you. And uh, albeit a Neve console. Right. <laughs> Not a bad thing to have in no, front of yeah. you. <laughs> but uh, your choice of limiter or compressor, in my case, was one of six 2254s. Um, Those are great. Yeah. But you've got six of them and they're all the same. You know, that's so you're limited to what you can get out of one of those or nothing. Mm -hmm. And then you get creative. You know, you do the obvious, um, use your hands. Uh, you can actually do compression with a fader manually. Yeah. But of course, there's no automation in that period. There was no automation then. And uh, so you're making hard work for yourself as well. But basically, that's what you know, you're doing um, relative dynamic changes when you've got time to do it, when you're not turning something on or off. So when you're imagining what you're describing there, is that sort of a move that is accompanying a vocal performance or some other instrument typically, performance? Typically, it's the dominant feature. You know, obviously, if you're during a guitar solo, it's the guitar. Right. But um, it's the thing there's a drum fill coming up, it might be the, the drums. Yeah. But yeah. Pretty much it's the vocal and everything. But it's not like 
it's not the kind of compression we think about when we're thinking about compressing a drum mic and kind of getting an no, explosive. No, no, it's not that sort sound. of compression. It's the type of compression where you're trying to make a, an automatic volume control. Yeah. yeah um, trying to compensate for a less than perfect performance mm -hmm. dynamically. Let's say you've got someone playing a flute and they may not be a professional flautist and, you know, they've got that one little note that they love, like a singer, you know. <laughs> oh, I can really belt this <laughs> one out. My favorite note. <laughs> Oh, here comes an E. I can have a go at that, you know. Um, so you here in Nashville, we call that ah, ye. Yeah. <laughs> ye all, yeah. It's um. <laughs> so I mean, you you you, and of course, being young at that time, it, the capacity and the need to absorb and recall in advance. Everything that's required, you know, it's it's phenomenal what you can remember within a three minute time span. So let me see if I'm following you. Are you referring to um, having had the experience where you needed to get all your dynamic balances correct in the recording stage, and then coming you back know, to that again later? Is that what you, you know? Mean? Basically, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining what it is. What I still you can have, blame it on my questions. Uh, yeah, right. Here's the right answer to the wrong question. It's um, what I discovered the other day when I was doing this mix was that I love doing it. And what, you know, you can't help, sorry, I'm, when I say you, I mean me. I can't help having my opinion expressed. Yeah, it's one of the things I love about you and your work. <laughs> it's... Um, you know, I want to do what I say I'm going to do. Put the artist first and give the best representation of what I've been given. Eventually, I got the confidence and the ability to, to not allow myself to have to show everything I was given. Right. I, I, you know that mute button, cut switches we used to call it, the mute button can be such a good friend. You know, space is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but a vacuum isn't. You know, right. <laughs> it, 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 for us, you know, unless it's in a tube. It's um, it's a wonderful thing. And and just even if it's only temporary, temporary turn stuff off. You know, um, but by the same token in your head, have everything on. It's, um, it sounds really trippy, but you can hear more when you turn stuff off than uh, constantly listening to everything. Having said that, there's a fantastic value in always having the lead instrument, i.e. the vocal, there. Right. And bounce off of it. Yeah. Because you're trying to enhance or support or distract from the the vocal, you know. Um, but it's a it's a it's a fun thing to do, and I just just love doing it. The, the unfortunate thing is that when asked, so what do you do? I I honestly don't really know. I'd have to look back and see what I. Done. What, you, what you did. Yeah, I can't yeah, tell you yeah. what I do. I can just tell you what I did. Yeah, I as was, long as it's not too long ago. <laughs> yeah. I, and unfortunately, I, I that was made a, blatantly aware to me when I was mixing a, a project about 10, 10 or more years ago at Blackbird. And uh, someone came in while I was mixing and they were apparently enjoying what they were hearing. And they looked over at the console and they said, uh, you're not doing anything. Well, that was wrong. I had two high-pass filters going. Nice. You know? And one of those I wasn't sure about. You know? Yeah. <laughs> one of those was there because I knew I should, you know? But the other one I needed. It was, um, yeah, everything was going on 
in two ways. Anything I was doing was being done with the faders, the mute switches, and external processing of the two mix. Right. I know that that's an important part of it. I've heard you talk about that a bit before, and so definitely want to ask well, you about you yeah, know, some well, that's, thoughts there. That's, um, it's logical in my, in my logic, and it's um, a way of tipping your hat to the people that have come before you. If you're given a project to mix, and you've, this is the first time you've been involved in the project, you've got n- none of the flavor of attitudes of anybody involved or the struggles and getting it that good, even though it's not good enough. You know, all those things we go through when we're recording, like, you should have heard it before I got it, all those sort of things, they don't count. What I like to do is imagine that the people presenting it to me have done a great job, right? And the reason it isn't sounding good is because I haven't got it right yet. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I want to do is like, if it if it gen, globally it sounds a bit woolly or it sounds a bit dry, I'll try and recreate an environment where it doesn't sound woolly anymore globally and doesn't sound dry anymore globally. I.e., I'll put an EQ and a compressor over the two mix, mm-hmm. and then I can start to feel maybe this is what it was made them excited. You know, because now it does feel a bit more exciting. Yeah. And you can start balancing rather than nitpicking individual sounds. You know, because they become they become less crucial individually and more crucial as part of the the whole jigsaw, you know. Yeah. Sometimes I think of it like a guitar and guitar amp analogy. So some guitars, yes, you can just plug it direct into a board and listen to that, and you're like, boy, that guitar sounds great. But a lot of times the guitar just sounds kind of plinky, you know, the, the pickups by itself. But when you put it into the amp and you start to perform it with the dynamic and, you, and you're, you know, you're putting, pushing the right sounds into the amp, all of a sudden it just comes to life. Absolutely. And I like to think of the two mix like that, um, where it's like, you know, you get your two mix right, it's like setting your guitar amp tone yeah. Now you can play those faders and those sounds into it. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the projects that I've been involved in that have turned out to be both commercially and sonically praised, you've had that other step. The difference in sometimes a guitar sounds a bit plinky, but there again, sometimes that plinky sounding guitar in the right hands doesn't sound plinky because the plinkiness itself is so entertaining. It's so pure, right, it's right, so great right. that it becomes a great sound. Well, can I have some of that plink? You know, yeah. because it doesn't sound like that when I'm playing it. <laughs> Put a you slap know? on it and we're, it take us right to the 1980s. Well, anything <laughs> else, you, yeah, anything else you do after that is icing on the cake. You know, I think I may have mentioned before, well, I know I've mentioned before, but, you know, our one of our prime directives is to not get in the way of a good sound. Right. You know, and I would say the other side of that is just because it sounds good doesn't, don't assume that that's as good as it's going to get either. Right. Um, It's terrible temptation to be told that this is Eric Clapton recorded by Nico Volus or whatever, you know, at... Capital Studios, that you, okay, it's done. Yeah. Right. Right. Don't even look at it. Right. <laughs> Start from that. That could be the right thing to do, and it could be the wrong thing to do. You know, because you, without knowing whether that guitar was done as part of a, a three three piece tracking session, and now you've got sixty pieces on the track. Right. There's no way of they could know what they were doing was the definitive thing because you know, there was another 57 elements to be added. Right. So you have to now make that decision. As, yes, that was right at the time. Is it right now? Right. You know, uh, and that's one of the things we do. Uh, and sometimes you've also got to be courageous enough to know, you know, there's 57 things here that need to be turned off. Right. Because it was right 
they were right. Boy, that's one of the hardest things to do. Oh, I remember so hard. working on a record where we spent three weeks spending a lot of time and money in an expensive studio. We were at Sunset Sound, and we were recording all kinds of stuff that we were working really hard on and feeling great about. And, well, feeling great about bits and pieces of, but maybe not the whole thing. And then we worked for months and months and months and months trying to continue with those tracks when really what needed to be happened was just to have them deleted and start over. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to make the decision to just hit that mute button. But it's, I always say that's the first most powerful tool you have in production and mixing is just mute. It is. That and mono. Again, I'm repeating myself. Yeah. Sorry, we like repetition here. Do you good? It's, um, well, the mute button and mono are your two best friends. Mono um, as in like, for listen, you know, we're mixing in stereo, but we're, we're checking it in mono or just? D yes, but mono, period. Um, don't use two mics when one will do. Right. Certainly don't use seven when one will do. And don't put them on seven tracks when you do use seven mics when one will do. Because they're all decisions waiting to be a problem later. Yeah. And uh, it's just deferred attitude, deferred. And that adds to sterility, you know, because then who knows that seven tracks go to somebody and going back to what we've already said, somebody thinks, well, there must be seven mics there for a reason. I must right. need to use them all. Yeah. Otherwise, they're going to say, what happened to my upper, upper left room mic? You know, it's like, yeah. It, yeah. it upper, upper left the yeah. mix. <laughs> uh, uh, many occasions, and I do mean many occasions, that uh, uh, a rock track's been given to me and there's two guitars, bass and drums, and they go beyond 24 tracks, you know. <laughs> and um, the number of tracks doesn't equate to the quality of the sound and certainly yeah. has no influence on the performance. Yeah. Um, typically. I get a guitar and there's four mics for the guitar and they're labeled amp left, amp right, you know, 414, 57, whatever it is. And then you've got two room mics. One's a Telefunken 250 and you've got a whatever. You know, it goes from... Uh, having listened to the song, basically, with the faders just pushed up, I then go through and I just listen to each of those four mics. The one that sounds like a guitar is the one I use. Yeah. Just toss it. the others. Well, unless the best sounding one is the 250, you know, which is 10 feet away, you've got to take the timing factor into account right. and, and the actual point. So in that case, I might be forced to use one of the closer mics just to give it a point. Or if the room mic is really just all I need, then nowadays I have the option of bringing it into time. Right. How often do you find yourself doing that? And is Lots. that really so so taking that room mic and moving it forward to be closer to the timing of the close mic is a, you is know, a useful thing sometimes? Yeah. I've been on record so many times saying I hate digital. Um digital is so much worse than analog that everything that goes on. Don't say it too loudly. We don't want Pro Tools to crash while we're recording the interview. That won't be the reason it crashes. Um, <laughs> be one of those features that won't be in the next version. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it, yeah, the, the, the only thing that digital is good at is everything analog can't do. Right, right. And for that, I love it. Yeah. Well, I agree. I think that there's, all these tools we have available to us in the studio. And the thing I, I've enjoyed doing is figuring out like, well, what's this one good at? What's this one good at? What's this one good at? Let's put them together. And now we've got this new thing. It's yeah. probably like guitar. I don't know why I always go back to guitars, but it's like guitar pedals on a pedal board. Mm -hmm. That's probably why somebody has a distortion pedal they really like, a delay pedal they really like, a reverb pedal, a phaser or a flanger or something. Yeah. As you know, some of the things that we we buy or go to is because we've heard them used in a certain context and we want to have that. We want to know that we can do that too, you know? Um, but shifting, you know, the mic in, say, for example, Pro Tools, 
uh, it's 10 feet too far away, i.e. 10, rule of thumb, 10 milliseconds too late. Moving that 10 milliseconds early <laughs> is just not even worth talking about because it's so easy. It, back 40, 50 years ago, that would require you being in a studio um, and multi-track, obviously, and you would be playing the the late item, if it was on its own track, of the sync head during the mix. Right. So it was head gap early. Well, depending on the machine, determined what that head gap was. Let's say it's 60 milliseconds. Obviously way too much. So then you have to employ another tape machine to delay it by less than 60 milliseconds. Right. So you can get somewhere close to where you where you were, you know, so 60, 50 equals to 10. Wow. You I know, bet you get an interesting little sort of phasing effect, though, out of the imperfections of the tape machines. Well, yeah. I mean, the, you didn't even think about it. Well, that's kind of the the, the um, um, John Lennon automatic double tracking, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a version of that. Yeah. In a way. Well, the, the end result is, yeah. yes. But, um, uh, you know, that's one of the ways, again, if you were lucky enough to work in a studio where they had a, a Studer, A80 or above, had simultaneous outputs. You could choose to have right. a sync and a repro at the same time. Yeah. You know? So uh, you could do phasing as well then if you wanted. Well, um, I use those machines sometimes for the double outputs so that one output was input and one output was the repro. And that was a trick for recording into Pro Tools and then and capturing both your real-time recording and your bounce-off tape recording. Mm. If you want so to ship so that one out output was input. That's good. I like yeah. that. That's a good way of thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, every, every device has its, if, if you want, rules. Like, this is the input, this is the output. If you have a mindset that says, maybe, you know, you can you create stuff. Usually, it's feedback and something horrible. Right. Because <laughs> sometimes you can literally. Uh, I know that I've on a, on a device have plugged into the output of uh, a line level device with a guitar, and for some reason, <laughs> some stupid reason, um, I was able to simultaneously monitor the output of that device. And I could hear the guitar, right? Um, and it was different from not doing that. Uh, no, right. it's like, but that's stupid. You can't unplug it into the output. But if it sounds cool, then it sounds cool. Yeah, it was, it was the device had jacks on the front for in and out, and it was hardwired at the back. Yeah. I was listening to it. I meant to go into the jack to the in, but I was stupid and put it in the output. But I heard something, and it was affected by the output of the, the gain control, you know, and it would change the sound of the guitar. Hey, you know, I have to remember that, but I didn't, yeah. you know, because it wasn't really much use. But it's, don't ever be dangerous. Obviously, you don't want to go and plug your guitar into the wall socket, you know. Well, and also, do make sure you plug a speaker into the output of your guitar amp. We made that mistake recently. Yeah, that's a good one. We lost a guitar head. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of guitars, Richard, when we were doing a little bit of a studio tour, you had a really cool, uh, you know, despite us just talking about finding the one mic, you had a really cool two mic technique for miking an open backed combo. Mm -hmm. You're talking about um, a trick you had done with Mike Campbell. Do you want to share that with us? Sure. I was just mentioning that on one occasion, this is back in 1990, I believe, a, a C studio at Rumbo. And, uh, Mike could just set up his guitar sound and he said, uh, I'd like to have the end result sound more like it does while I'm standing here. Yeah, I've heard that request before. Sometimes the doors open in the control room and they're like, why does that sound awesome? You yeah. Know? And there's probably a thousand ways of doing that, but on the spot, I thought, there's something I've been, now's the time to try it. You know, it takes a few seconds. Yeah. And we had, um, I had a pair of realistic PZMs, you know, the ones from oh, yeah. Radio Shack. Yeah, the classics. Because I couldn't afford the real ones, you know. And um, I couldn't afford to invest that amount of money. There was other things, you know. And um, so 
I left my 57, SM57, in its usual place in front of the speaker. And I gaffer taped, duct taped, uh, a PZM to the back of this open back. Because they're partially open, as you mm -hmm. as probably everybody knows. There's about six inches of band that goes behind the amp. Yeah, and, and hiding behind which is the guts of the, yeah, the amp yeah, itself. The amp. So it just taped it on there, um, came back in, had him play, had him, sorry. I, I asked Mike if he wouldn't mind playing. And uh, I brought up the 57, and it, there it was, as usual. I had 1176 across it, as usual. And it sounded good, as usual. And then I brought up the PZM, did a quick 180 phase flip, polarity flip, to see which were the better of the two, blended it in, lo and behold, I had a much more interesting, much more, oh, I'm standing here, here in the amp sound than without it. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and a PZM, do you think of a PZM as an omni microphone or a directional or does that... Is that, am I asking the wrong question? No, no, it's a good question, and you should ask somebody that knows. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is an omni one, but the way it gets used, yeah. because it's boundary, it becomes directional. Yeah. I I pretty much look at it and go, that's an omni, but I can be told otherwise. Now, when you did this with the combo and the PZM taped to the back, was this in a big open space, no, the amp, no, or was no, it no, sort no, of in an ISO booth? ISO booth, yeah. Um, you know, because otherwise the, the simple thing is we'll stick a room mic up. Right. But if the room is a closet and sounds like one, you know, what are you going to do? Right. So right. the farthest you can get away in a situation like that is right there. You know, yeah, looking like the other I way. I like that. Trying to get away from the room. How do you get away from the room? You go right to the Well, amp. To, to, to maximize the size of the room as far as a mic, you know, two mics are concerned. In this, I mean... The furthest you can get away from the the amp, if you like, if you've got, let's say, a tr traditional situation, you've got a 57 looking at a speaker cone. Well, the furthest you can really usefully get away from that is have another 57 at the speaker cone facing away from the amp. Right. Oh, interesting. I see what you're saying. That's as yeah. far as you can get. Yeah, because then the sound has to travel to the far wall and bounce again. all the way back. Yeah. Yeah. However, that's a, a theory that is nicely disproved by the net result <laughs> right. because the second mic, the so supposed room mic, actually acts more like a ribbon microphone because it's getting quite a lot of pretty loud, pretty direct, pretty immediate bleed. Right. As well as the reflections. Yeah, the low end isn't really uh, yeah, so blocked this, out. Right, which is a good thing. You know, obviously, you flip the phase because one's fading the other. So um, polarity, sorry. I Different generations of people maybe listen to this, and we older guys are going to call polarity phase flip. Right. And it's even logged on the board as phase flip. It is not. It's polarity. Right. So instead of going in, it's going out. Instead of going out, it's going in. Simple as that. Phase can be anything between 1 and 359.999, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, back to that. So that's always a good trick you know, to increase the size of the room is uh, you can do that. Um, you can also, if you've got a small environment and you want the sound of a larger environment, um, certainly in analog, you can speed your source up, like double speed, right, right. feed it into the room, record that result at its maximum, and when you get it back to normal speed, it's twice. Yeah, you know, um, not to go on a tangent, but I remember when I was first starting recording school and I went to the AES meetings, there was a paper written about a new technique pre-digital where they would build a scale size model of an auditorium for architectural design and they would pump high frequencies into it and measure that with a measurement mic. And then they would slow that down, I guess maybe just on the graph or maybe they'd listen to it that way and it would sh it would emulate what that same space would sound like when it was full size. So I think that stuff's really fascinating. Yeah, I tried actually doing that. I, I wanted to, you know, um, build a device that I could, a, a little box that would be my acoustic studio, as it were. That oh, I could really? Wow. 
uh, just using that principle, but it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how you find out. You got to go try it. I did a mic shootout for my vocals in the studio and tried 20 different microphones from the Shure SM7 to a vintage Neumann U67, but was impressed that my favorite of all was the Roswell Pro Audio Delphos 2 large diaphragm condenser. Handcrafted in California, Roswell Mics brings you inspired design and attention to detail to help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful microphones, including the Mini K47 for only $349 at Roswell Pro proaudio.com Well so Richard I you know I sort of promised we'd do some mixing stuff on this too and you talked about this the stereo mix bus you know ways to set that right and start mixing into it um, so why don't we start there if you don't mind I know you you're probably trying different things all the time but give us some stuff to go try just like you know Show us what blue, red, and green sounds like. Um, you know, what are what would be a cool thing for us to go experiment with as far as our mix bus and start understanding what could sound cool? Um, the most immediate would be a good stereo compressor with a slow attack and a fast release and quite a high ratio. Can you explain to the rock stars what, what that means? What is a slow attack and what sure. is a fast release? Okay. Um, Let's say you've got a device like a limiter or a compressor that is designed to affect the dynamic, change the dynamic. So instead of, you've got very loud and quite soft, you would use a compressor or limiter to reduce the difference between those two. Now the tonal difference in those two examples will remain pretty much the same. But the relative volume, loudness of the two would be nearer to each other depending on how much you ask the device to do. So then you've got two other elements that come in, attack and release, at least two other elements. Attack is how quickly the device does what you've asked it to do. And release is how quickly or otherwise it stops doing what you've asked it to do. So simple. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. And if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but I've used that philosophy for... No, I think that's correct. Um, Yeah, uh, just in case... uh, People, someone's listening that actually knows what they're talking about, other than someone like me. My method of of coming to any device is I make a circuit diagram in my mind of how it could possibly work. And from then on, if I'm proved right, that's how it works. You know, the fact of whatever else is going on inside doesn't interest me. Right. You just need an, um, a way to think about it so you can move so on can and use start it. creating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, now, are you again, you said a slow attack. Mm-hmm. Is there, do we need to care about numbers in milliseconds or do we need to care about what, what the result is that we're hearing no. as far as when we say, oh, that's slow, therefore I'm hearing this right now? I, I think um, you do need to care, but please, even if it's only a, a remake or a reissue, Great device to use and especially to learn on is a is a 1176, a Yuri 1176. We like this. Yeah, where you've got an input control, an output control, you've got buttons for different ratios, which is just a bit kind of thinking that in terms of how strong it is. Um, and so based on the theory that you don't want too much coming out of the device, be ready to adjust that. You want it to do so something, so that's the input. So be ready to adjust that. So it's doing. You've got a meter. If you can't hear it, you can switch your meter in that case to GR gain reduction, where the meter will go down the more it works, as opposed to when it's on output, it goes up the louder it is. So then you can just ideally start with something percussive to help you learn the device, mm-hmm. say a snare drum, where you can. Use the attack time to hear. I would say on an 1176, start with the 20 to 1 button in. Certainly as an educational thing. Crank up the input, have the meter selected to gain reduction, and have that meter come swing down at least 6 to 10 dB on every hit. And adjust the output so you're not blowing anything up, like I just did, sorry. And... uh, 
then mess with your attack time. You'll find that when you have the attack on fast, the snare will begin to spit at you. Mm -hmm. And when you have the attack on full slow, you'll hear more of the real thing and a cool reaction, like a reverb, like an echo. Mm -hmm. Very, very fast, but like an echo. So you get the cow, as it were. Then you've got your release time. If you have the release very slow and the tempo of the strikes of the snare very fast, you may find that you're still, the device is still reacting to one hit when the second hit comes through. Right. And so therefore that sound you just liked on that slow attack is not there because it's still responding to that first hit. So one of the reasons to have a faster release is so that you can say, go away and get ready for the next time I want you to do something. Nice. And that brings in a whole much more. If you skip now 10 years of doing this, and you realize that when you're mixing on the two mix, you can adjust the attack and release to affect the rhythm, the apparent rhythm of the song. You can almost put in a syncopation, give it some swing, if it, the track hasn't got some sw hasn't got the swing, you know, um, or a, a pulse, you can emulate and exaggerate the one that's there. You can tune it to the tempo of the track almost, or you can counter tune it to in, imply a, a second rhythm. And now you start to get excited, and then you realize that the cost of that compressor is added a rhythm but it's made it feel a bit softer, the track softer or a bit woollier or the opposite. So enter the EQ. And uh, if you start by putting the EQ after the compressor, you can learn about the compressor, what the compressor is, has done and what can be recovered. Mm -hmm. But if you want to find out what you can do with a compressor, you put the... EQ before the compressor. Okay, interesting. Because now all those settings you had, which were working for you quite well, you have a whole new world. You, again, starting point on the EQ, on a decent EQ, a medium Q, that is uh, the width of the band. So you're starting at 1K. Um, with a wide Q and you turn up 1K 2 dB, then you're also turning up 2K and 500 cycles half a dB. Right. On a very narrow Q at 1K, you turn it up 2 dB, you're hardly affecting 3K or 250 cycles at all. Mm -hmm. And so that's what cues it. So you have it on a moderate Q. Start about 1K which is just about where every sound exists, is 1K, um, and turn up globally 1K. And all of a sudden, your, your, your mix now becomes, oh, it's not muddy anymore. You there's know? clarity in there. It, there's, yeah, because now all the action is on the meat and potatoes of the sound, but it's by default leaving alone some of the more sonically interesting bits, the... The, the hair and the shoes, you know? Mm -hmm. and the hair and the shoes. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. So, yeah, um, that's great. It's great um, analogy. Yeah. So they, they feel a bit more natural, although the track has been made unnatural. And before you know it, you're just in this whole world of, and you've just learned another lesson. Hey, you know, uh, this isn't so difficult. This mixing thing is pretty easy. Yeah. So, okay. So, all right. So um, I'm going to say a little bit of that back to you. Um, we're, we're exploring, we're beginning a mix on something and we're starting with what we want to do with the stereo bus and putting that compressor on the stereo bus and finding the rhythmic elements and the way that it kind of breathes and interacts with it that makes us excited is a, is a place that's good to start. And then exploring um, an EQ after that that maybe compensates for the way that that compressor maybe darkens or makes the sound a little woollier um, bringing up, I love what you said about like everything is in 1K. It's like 
what a what a great way to think about music that if we hear it then 1k is the is the frequency we hear the most of well i, I well i'm not contradicting you i think sonically it's more like 2k or two and a right, half okay, is okay. the easiest one to hear right right but in terms of we in yes you're correct when we go back to musicality it's more around the 1k ish right so um obviously like you know kicks and basses and low frequency things have all this bass down there but if if I, i'm going to interpret that and say if we do more than just feel it if we're hearing it then there's some 1k in there that's important yeah kind of another way of look at even those instruments that don't seem to have much 1k in them when you're turning the volume down the last thing you're going to hear of those instruments is 1k right <laughs> well, my... you know it's um yeah. you know and the worst speaker in the world is pretty good at reproducing 1k yeah yeah so um if you've got your 1k balance right you you you're going to you're going to win it's and and all this stuff is is you can't teach anyone how to mix in my opinion you can show them some options and if they've got it if they've got the chops or the potential to learn or a way that works for them then this is something you can try these are there's no magic bullet right right um you just need to have a vision for enjoying music so that you can, you know, motivate yourself towards oh, yeah. a great sounding mix. You, right? You'll know when you're doing it right because you won't want to stop. And then it's the, then you've got to learn how to stop. Right. <laughs> you're <laughs> jumping ahead to one of my questions. Sorry. Um, well, so maybe we might as well tackle it while we're here, but how do you know when to stop? Well, the, we never really stop. We, never we, really we, stop give, we give up. You know, in a good sense or a bad sense, we give up pretty much. Well, that's as good as I can get it, which you mean is as good as anyone can get it, right? right. And um, and you and everybody on. likes it. Well, if it's a hit, you were right. You know, yeah. If the, you get paid, you are kind of right. <laughs> you know? And uh, what if you just really enjoy it afterwards? Well, then that's everybody else's fault. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Um. Okay, so uh, let me let me back up a tiny bit. Um, we're talking about the two mix, uh, the compression and the EQ. We're gonna ex- we should experiment with the EQ after the compressor, and then you know in plug-in land, it's easy. You just drag it over before the compressor and listen to what that does too. Right, and I'd like to reiterate that these are for pretty new people. They you know start with the compressor. Because it's such a powerful device. Yeah. The and people are already, before they even start thinking about doing this, accustomed to tonal changes. You know, might just be a tone control in the old days or treble and bass or top and bottom, whatever you've got to, somewhere along the line in your car or or whatever, you've come across tonal options. Yeah, that was my first piece of studio gear was just a graphic equalizer mm. in my car and I used to play with it. Absolutely. Constantly yeah. listening to music. But there weren't many with 1176s, you know. Yeah. I would have them. But, <laughs> but um, except for FM, of course, uh, radio broadcast, that we were already presented with the 1176 on the music. Yeah. You know, they're already doing through necessity some of the stuff I do for fun, you know, smashing the hell out of something. But then, like you say, it arrives in your vehicle and now you can fix it. You mm-hmm. can have the fun and the tone. You yeah. put, and that's why I said put start by doing that because it's real life. It's what we're used to. But uh, if you put yourself back into the radio studio where someone's given you something good, but you've got to make it interesting and broadcastable and compete with the jingles, then you know that's that's what happened. You can be there and you can change it all so that the compressor hopefully does what you want it to do. Yeah. All right. So um, we've got this stuff on our stereo bus, what are the elements that we should be pushing into that stereo bus so that we can start making a judgment call on it? Um, You know, I think a lot of times we might be inclined to start building a mix from the drums up or something like that. And um, one of the challenges I have is if I'm listening to that stereo bus, I'm like, am I just making stereo compression decisions that should just be on the drums right now if I'm only listening to the drums. 
do you recommend, you know, pulling up the whole song and just sort of, you know, without doing anything to the individual elements, just sort of striking balances into that stereo compression to start getting a feel for it? Yes. However, you'll quickly get to a stage where th- either through necessity, habit, laziness, or inspiration, you'll go straight for the bass guitar or straight for the vocal or straight for the kick drum, whatever it is. You know, you'll get to that point and you'll live through that. And then you'll end up full circle when you've gone through that phase of your life, coming back to putting everything up and mixing everything. Because um, hopefully you get to mix what you've recorded. Um, which is both the easiest and the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Because you already know how great it's been recorded. Or you're shitting yourself because you didn't work out the way you'd planned. Or you, you, you just refuse to let go of those 13, any of those 13 drum mics because you put in the work to put them there. Right. And now you're wondering why. You know? Yeah. Because, uh, well, you know why. It's in case somebody else has an opinion, which isn't your opinion, and you need to be able to give them the option that otherwise may not be available if you'd put all 13 mics down to two. Right. Except maybe that option is available. You, You might get more fun out of trying to recover from a bad decision, a commitment, than actually having the whole world and the whole palette in front of you and and not being able to decide which way to go. Yeah, that's a tough place to be. You know, uh, if the only road's a bumpy one, you try and avoid all the potholes and the rocks, right? But if you've got 13 roads to go down, which one do you pick? Yeah. How yeah. can you go down all 13? Sometimes I feel like uh, the more stuff you include, the more likely you are to balance yourself into a boring, gray, nothing. Right, which brings us to the beauty of digital recording. Because let's say, for example, this issue, as it often is, is a drum kit. It used to be the nightmare. You know, how do you get a good drum sound? Well, that's not the... The quest so much anymore. The quest now is how do you make the drums sound like they were a good drum sound. Right. right. You know, um, sometimes the recorded performance is just a bitmap to the end result. And the actual sounds used are none of the ones. The exception perhaps being the brassware, you know, the, the cymbals and hat. And nothing else remains of the original recorded sound. Because it's so easy to replace a sound so now. So easy to replace afterwards. a sound. And that's another thing you'll learn as well. I mean, I can, I've had uh, situations where the t- recorded sound, as it were, was so poor that I felt the need to replace all the sounds. And I had the facility and the skill to do that. And, you know, five or six hours later, everything was sounding pretty good. Yeah. Much better than it did. Or you can be really smart and send the track off to a drummer who has his own studio to replay it and come back and you've got the best of both worlds. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've had an artist request that we redo the drums and there's always a part of me that recoils at that request and then we go do it, and the results are, I'd say, ninety, you know, nine percent of the time, better because we re-recorded the drums than they were the first time. Not always, but um, but it's pretty remarkable how you know you there can be things like that where you're like, man, do I really have to? And then you go do it, and you're like, oh, that wasn't so hard. I, yeah, all these it. are all stepping stones as well. Um, these decisions, these situations. You know, the number of times when I've gone, oh, no, please, you can't, the purity of, you know, that is then. Everything you experience is a stepping stone towards the next thing you're going to experience. And uh, 
I sat in the studio as the engineer. We record tracking. It was in south of Brentwood somewhere. And um, we had a very, very good drummer. And the producer was so focused on something other than the drums that he actually said, when the drummer asked him if it, everything was good, he actually said, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll change anything we want later. You know, and, uh, you know, and he said to the assistant engineer, you know how to use, and he quoted a software that yeah. fixed timing. Right. You know, which wasn't actually very good, but uh, it was what we had then. Yeah. And uh, so I don't think, hang on, all you've got to do, the simplest thing in the world to do would be, at, especially with the drum we had, is to say, could we do this, this, and this, and redo it? And it would have been the length of the song to fix it. Yeah, yeah. If that, if it was the whole song that needed changing, you know. Um, I mean, th th we're talking about some really high quality players. Yeah. But no, it was in, in the end, it was going to take a couple of kids, you know, with their computers. A day or two. Of a day or two, it. and eventually it'll come back along with the singer's inability to sing in tune, modified. And all that stuff, you know. All the reasons for actually making the record are irrelevant. The end result being up to a then contemporary requirement yeah. was what, what it was about. It's a shame. That didn't used to be the way. doesn't have to be the way. Especially doesn't have to be the way when we can actually do all those things better now. Yeah. Let people be musicians. Yeah. Record what they do. Help them not need any of that stuff. You know, make sure their headphone balance is good. Make sure they've actually rehearsed. If they're the singer, they actually know the words that they're singing. They know the melody. Yeah, right. They know the attitude before they get in the studio. Yeah, people are, are capable of remarkable things when they're pointed in the right direction. With yeah, and, and if you spend time with them while they're getting ready for the session, you can find out whether you need to cancel the session or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, let's take a break now for just a moment. We'll come back in for the second half of the show. Um, Rockstar's a reminder that we're going to have links to stuff we're talking about here, uh, a link over to Richard's website where you can learn more about him. And, of course, I've got a YouTube playlist full of some of the great records that Richard has done. So you should go listen to that. We'll see you in just a minute for the jam session. The Spectra 1964 model was created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that have protected the free world for over half a century. The extremely stable high circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you clearer, punchier, dynamic recordings. During the height of record making, the 101 preamp was the perfect choice to build consoles for Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and New York City Records. Record plant, bringing you the sounds of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. The Spectra 1964 legacy is carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. Now you can get that same sound in your studio with the STX100 Mic Pre and STX500 EQ. Add the Cinemag Transformer BBDI and the C610 Comp Limiter, and you can have a truly awesome sound. Go to Spectra1964.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your 
studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave Pensato, and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish it was an easy solution right now? Quisp Room Isobooths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisp Room has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session, second half of the show. My guest today is Richard Dodd joining us here at the studio, and we're going to just keep talking about mixing and making cool records and whatever else we talk about. Ready to jam? Yes, sir. All right, cool, man. Um, You had mentioned the world of drums and sometimes you have seven mics, sometimes you have 13. I can easily do something here where I'm like, well, we want these, this, this, and uh, 13 tracks out of my two, 16 that are on the two inch. And I often feel like, man, what what am I doing wrong here? Why am I using up all my tape for, for just the drums? But let's say those tracks come into you to mix and they came from somebody else. What's a way that you want to guide people through narrowing that down and and making bold decisions around it? My method is uh, to listen to the mics marked as the furthest away first. That will give you a reasonably good idea. Hopefully they haven't been also crushed to death. But um, barring that in a more conventional situation, the overheads, because very typically people don't do much to the overheads. After all, it's only the symbols, right? It's not. It's where all, all your sound exists. I would, first of all, depending on the, the requirement of the song, you know, the style of music, etc. but if you're just going for a sound, the sonics, start with the overheads, then feed in some of the point microphones and see what you got. Yeah, just check just, your phase. So that starts with two right there, and right. then just bring in whatever is needed. Right, and you feel like I brought up it. that word phase again. Now this time, I mean phase. You're right. You may only have options of polarity immediately available, but I mean phase. You've got microphones pointing at each other, away from each other, at ninety degrees. Yeah, you know, no way can that be right. Right. So it may be interesting. May be wonderful, maybe what you want, but it can't be right. Um, once you've decided that you've got something to work with, pick a focal point, an audio focal point 
for your drum sound, which pretty much is either going to be the closest snare mic or the closest kick mic. Mm -hmm. And time the other mics accordingly. Uh, again, we're in a digital domain, so make use of it. You know, uh, if you were on the session and they've left the count in, you've got a nice trigger point on all those microphones. Count meaning the stick yeah. clicks together? Yeah. One, two, three. Right. Well, that click is on all those microphones. So the down and dirty way is to just go in, leave the snare where it is, and move all those other clicks so they line up to the snare. Really? Okay, because, you know, that's something that comes up occasionally, um, and it's, there seem to be mixed mm -hmm. feelings about it. What are some of the things that you begin to hear when you line those up that you're like, this is, this is a good idea? Uh, all things being equal, you will hear something quite obviously different. Right. Now, that's, that's where you're at your learning stage. You know, you say, I've done this. And it's not like it's taken all day. You can now say, is any of this an improvement? Is, I mean, is this the answer to my problem? Right. Is this somewhere towards the answer to my problem? Or is this making matters worse? Right. Because the environment is going to dictate what the end result of that's going to be. Um, you will definitely hear a difference. Now, the odd man out in all this is the kick drum because not only is it at a different, happening at a different time relative to the snare, there's often a couple of mics there. They need to be brought in sync with each other. And is that a good idea? But moreover, the fact that they are only, for want of an argument, 90 degrees out of phase as opposed to 180 to uh, the understair mic, which you you know, one's pointing up, one's pointing down. That's pretty much 180 degrees out. Right. It's not exactly because of the distance between them, but 180 usually does the job. But the kick drum's 90. It's coming in from the side. Instead of one pointing down, you've got one point on the side. What are you going to do about that? You know, there isn't a 90-degree button on, on the thing. But there are plugins. Yeah. And if you don't have a plug-in to adjust for phase, you have this time element. You can literally just sit there with a nudge button, just seeing if going one way or the other improves the situation for you. And that's the best way to do it. And all this takes virtually no time at all. Um, if you have access to an analog console, and you've got, I have an eight-channel Soundcraft XL. Uh, not Soundcraft, sorry. I used to have Soundcraft. No, it's an SSL. Mm -hmm. And it's an all-analog little eight-channel. The beauty of it is, is that I can output my eight main drum tracks, and I have instant multiple access to phase buttons. So I can, while, I, while I've got a loop playing with a drum fill in it or whatever, I can try the phase on the tom-toms. I can try right. the phase in the overheads. I can try just the overheads and the, and the kick. I can learn, while listening in mono, what gives me the most sound. What, and yeah, it's, I think it's clever that you brought up the mono thing again. That's something I'm learning to do when checking the phase is listen in mono. I guess you do want to be able to hear. You don't necessarily want to be super low volume for this because you do want to hear the low end coming out of the speakers, right? That's true. But by the same time, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, anything that's subtle isn't a problem. Right, exactly. You know, <laughs> if you can't hear the difference, you honestly can't witness the difference between in phase and out phase of two microphones. You're but, either dumb, deaf, or it's irrelevant. Right, or it's you're mostly right. mostly irrelevant. Or you're right, like who cares? <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, I've yeah. noticed, you know, you ever notice sometimes you, you're checking the rim mics and you're like, this way the snare sounds good to me, this way the kick sounds good to me. Yeah. And then I guess you just have to decide which one you want. Well, we used to, but now you can you can have both. You can move, What what is it about the rim mic that is not good for the kick? 
Um, usually the kicks one way on the rim mic seems to have a deeper low end. Not to mention then in that moment, I'm also wondering like, am I just hearing a mode in my control room that's fooling me right now? Or is yeah, that there really is the always that. But I mean, don't limit yourself. And I'm not accusing you of doing this, but... You can accuse me of no, anything no, you want. But, but, it's, but we're, we're today. We're not yesterday. Make that two room mics. And move one of them to suit the kick and the other to suit the snare and see right. what you've got. Right, yeah. And don't use all of the room mic. We have filters. You, you can put a filter on that room mic on two different tracks and use the bit that has most of the snare on it to suit the snare and the bit that has most of the kick, the low end, to suit. You can subdivide the room right, mic. Right, And subdivide its relative polarity. You couldn't do that before. You know, there's so... Re well, you could, I guess, but use so much equipment, whereas it wouldn't even take the amount of time I've ex taken to explain it to do it nowadays. Right, yeah. There's no getting out of your chair, running out, getting a different mic. You know, it's... So it sounds like when you're addressing these things, you give yourself the room to explore and experiment and stumble on things, like try stuff, try stuff, try stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, when you've got the time to learn, take that room mic that almost sounds like a whole drum sound and make it the drum sound. You know, what about that? What about taking the room mic and making it your overhead? Bring it in time with the snare and just use the other mics to supplement the room mic instead of using the room mic to supplement the drums. Right, right. There's no rules. And then I guess one way, you know, you do that and then you listen and you're like, does this, do I like the song like this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if so, does that make sense of the guitar now? Instead of using that 57 on the, on the cone, how about I use the, just the PZM that I just learned about, you know, it's, or somebody who already knew about or whatever. Because it suits the, the sound now that I've got going for the drums. You've got a, something that no one's ever heard before. And you may have even turned the mix in. You know, this is something that you just come back to because you've still got it. Yeah, we got to keep doing our homework. Yeah, you have to. Because next time you get presented with something anywhere near, you can go straight for the, the thing you didn't do last time. Create a new sound. You know, um, I, I say this often, but one of the, my favorite things is when it's, a, you know, if it's my studio, if it's a studio that I'm working in all the time, and then somebody else comes in to use it, is for me to not start by telling them all the things that works for me. Just let them, just see, find out what they're going to do, because you can, I always so quickly discover some great new way to do something, because somebody else did it a completely different way. And I'm like, that sounds killer, you know? Mm -hmm. Um I, do you have any stories about that, about that experience where you see somebody else do something, you're like, thank God you did it the way I don't do it so that I could discover that? Well, yeah, but I must admit, I was always guilty of, if anybody knew anything about the studio, I would, I'd have no qualms about saying, so where do they set the drums up? You know? Yeah. Um, because we're all, given that we're working in an in a era they're pretty much all pros. Right. And um, it's hard to hide a drum kit in the studio. So it's not like a secret or anything. You know, there's certainly nuances of miking technique and mic choices that are going to make a massive difference between people. But pretty much if the consensus is the drums sound best, which in a lot of cases means the easiest to get something good, mm -hmm. fastest, you put them there, then that's what you do. But by the same token, you also know that when no one's looking, you might have someone go hit a snare drum in the hallway. You know, because in my experience, some of the best places to record music are not studios. Right. <laughs> you know, with, again, I'm getting a lot of stick, but, some of the worst sounding studios in the world are designed by experts. Yeah. Well, it seems like studio design inherently has an element of um, neutrality or something like that, where you're trying to not screw something up. Whereas 
things that have true characteristic are things that totally screw something up and speak loudly because they did so, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of people, uh, I don't know whether any of them uh, will hear this, but worry about their, you know, they're competing with the world's best studios and they have a bedroom to compete in. Don't worry about it. You can do that. Just make your listing environment work for you. You know, a commercial, famous commercial studio, whatever, that environment has to work for many people simultaneously. Right. And that is very, very difficult to do. But um, I tell you, you can make a really good variable, if you like, monitoring system. I know you can. For under 400 bucks, start to finish, that you can rely on. You know, uh, just by choosing your monitors and placing them appropriately, period. I mean, full stop. Yeah. If you want to discount the room, get closer to the speakers. Put the speakers closer to each other. You know, and where's this heading? Mono. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about mono and why mono is important and, and um, you know, referencing your mixes in mono and all that. Just any of the stuff you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, mono is the coming together of everything. Um, mono will filter... Mono will present you with the end result, warts and all. You have two mics on one instrument. You listen to them both at equal volume to each other. In mono, you will hear what you have. If you split them into stereo, you won't hear the sum of those. You'll hear two individual elements. And the difference between you will be space, a space that is a negative space. It will tend to, the more accurate the placement of the mics are, the more appropriate the placement of the mics are, the more solid the sig signal will appear, the more defined the phantom image. You know, you've got two microphones on one instrument, you've got one hard left, one hard right. That phantom center, will be more solid the more appropriately the mics are placed. If you've got two different microphones, you're going to notice that center wavering. Um, literally, according to... Richard's the, shimmying back and forth. Sorry, the mic yeah. Right I'm now, very <laughs> sorry. No, that's good. It's, I did, um, help help it, with the visuals there. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, living radio. It's... Uh, that's the the best way to do it. You can you, and when it's very wrong, you'll feel the sound coming from outside of where you know the speaker to be on either side. It'll feel wide. Right. That's what fa out of phaseness makes things yeah, feel phase super difference, wide. Yeah. Phase shift, phasiness, which can be a great trick in the right moments. Right? It can be a great trick until it isn't. Right. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. You know. Um, <laughs> It's going to cost you. That effect is expensive. And with the resurgence of final, your name will be crap when it comes to ah, getting to vinyl. Yeah. That needle cannot go left and right at the same time. You know? it's, um, yeah, it doesn't like out of phaseness right. for vinyl. So, uh, plus, when you do hit mono, I mean, the number of tracks I've had to make phone calls about when I'm mastering, and you just play it and you go, whoa, whoa, hang on. You know, the most extreme being some idiot that had a mono electric piano, and it was a piano and vocal intro. And he thought, oh, what, this button makes it stereo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when it goes to mono, literally there was zero piano. That's and they so sent funny, it yeah. to mastering. You know, idiots. That's, that's where somebody doesn't, need to be in this business. If they're that dumb, you know, sorry. For the sake of hitting a mono, you can, what is it, M-A-A-T, the manufacturer, something like that. They've got a free plug-in. 
will probably you'll probably if you don't already have it have a link up for sure. it. Sure. And they have a free plugin you can download, which is wonderful of them. And it's uh, you can just put it on. Don't print with it in, but you can put it on your monitor last output, and that'll give you the option to hit a mono button. So you can do all this stuff just right there all the time. It also gives you an option to flip the left and right, which is something else you should do, especially when you're learning. Feel, you're amazing how different a track will feel when you flip the stereo. Um, right, flip your left and right. Because, because you can just do it on this device. You can play. And another important thing, it'll allow you to hear the difference. So that when you've reversed the phase of these two tracks, what's left? Well, right. It'll allow you to hear that. And if you hear something that sounds like a really good guitar sound, you've got problems. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> because that, that's what that you're not hearing in the mix. later, yeah. Yeah, it's going to go away. Yeah. It's a magical device. I, I believe it's M-A-A-T, but um, um, kudos to them. Yeah, I think um, another one that I'm thinking of is uh, Panipulator plugin, I think maybe has a mono button as well. And I, I think... Um, I think um, uh, some of the Boss uh, Digital Scout, yeah, some of some of the well. uh, Abbey Road plugins and yeah. stuff like that yeah. that UA, you know, so wonderfully have. It's um, you know, you might also find a mono button. Great, then use that. But you're also going to get the color they've designed into that plugin. Right, I see. Yeah, so you just want something that'll, that'll this give is you the just mono a mechanical mono. Yeah, yeah. Um, I find the mono thing is incredibly valuable when I'm mixing. Um, I use it in a couple of different ways now. I've actually recently started just muting one of my NS10s, so I'll just mm -hmm. only listen on the left. Mm -hmm. I'll turn off the subwoofer, mm -hmm. put it mono, and then just turn it down mm -hmm. to a quiet level. And all of a sudden, I'm like, "Boy, I can really hear what I'm doing." Well, and yeah, the one of the I'm not. Most, ti it's not tiring either. Yeah, one of the most interesting things, and you you alluded to or shot over it there, is it mono on one speaker. That's a whole new world. Mono on two speakers, because if we've got an inherent phase difference, right. isn't mono. Right. And but, then you've got uh, the room, the effects of the room right. too, and all that. Just to see how powerful mono is, you leave the room, you know, have a, 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 an acoustical mono. Have your stereo playing, and then go and leave the room through a doorway with the door open. Go and stand in another environment, and they've got the sum. Now, you're not going to hear the negatives that we've been talking about of cancellation, but you are going to be able to hear a balance, a mono balance, which will help you. Because mm -hmm. things will kind of show, rear their ugly head a little bit, you know, and also gives yourself an ear break from the intenseness of listening to the speakers. Um, you get another opinion to draw upon i love doing that i go into the kitchen and i just listen to mixes there and yeah you know if it needs to be up loud yeah leave well, it up what you're for looking the, for is else. for the when you're looking at a mix in general you're looking for the fun the entertainment the power all those things and they should be able to follow you into the kitchen what about low end do you so i, I will find myself hearing a different version of the low end in the other room. Of course. And sometimes I'm not sure if you should trust that much or not. No, no, um, no you're not going to make sonic decisions in another room. You're going to make fun content vibe. You know, that's, you find, that's a good time to say like, wow, that guitar solo just needs to be up more. Yeah, exactly. Is the vocal the main thing? Is it, if it's meant to be, is yeah. the vocal the main yeah. thing? When the solo comes comes in, does it overpower the vocal? Does it is it as interesting as the vocal? Uh, and for guitar, it could be anything. Whatever replaces the whatever the feature is that replaces the previous feature, does it at least match or better? You know, beware if it better's because something else might have to reappear, and now it's got to be better than it was before. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk a little bit about um, bass. Let's talk about bass guitar because I know mm -hmm. getting the low end right, right is an important thing. A struggle for me has been um, 
I think discovering punchy drums and wanting to pursue that for a while. And now I'm like, I don't want punchy drums. I want the bass drum to be felt and, and implied. And I want to, you know, I don't want it to compete with the mid range of the guitars and other elements. Um, and then you get the bass guitar. I don't even have a specific question about it other yeah. than what are some ways you like to think about addressing the bass and the kick drum and the bottom of a mix and, you know, what's appropriate for a song? Okay. The, again, sorry to be so repetitive, but the performance, the choice of notes and how they're presented is the, the most crucial thing to a bass sound, bar none. Um, if I can see a, that I've got an adequate bass player and he's got a part that suits the song, and he's got a Fender P bass, then all you need is a piece of wire. Don't do anything else. Just let let what he's trying to speak, speak. Yep. Don't do anything else. No limiters, nothing. Because if that bass is not balanced, that's the instrument and the player's responsibility, not yours. You should first get on the talk back, which is your other weapon, major weapon, and say, you know that... Uh, that E string's really coming out strong. Can you do something about that? Now he can either adjust his attitude or adjust the action or whatever it takes, the, pick, the pickup or whatever it takes to, to do that. Um, modify the part. You know, if you're really lucky, you're getting to play the whole part on the E string. You know, um, if you're not, then you're not. You know? So let's talk about why, why that's even a thing. Why is it a thing that um, a part being on the E string is different from a part that's using all the strings on a bass? Well, one of the reasons that all the strings are used is the convenience and the look, you know, and just the lack of arthritis or whatever, you know, and the economy of performance. So there's, there's little distance between what's going on. You know, it's cool. This guy knows his way around. But the tone on the bass is on the one string. Yeah. You know, um, you can just easily do it, even if you're not a bass player, and you have access to a bass guitar, plug it in and play the A on the E string, A note on the E string, and then just play the open A, or better still, you know, go semitone up. So they're both not open. You right. just hear the difference. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a different instrument day. between the different strings. It's why I love when I'm working with uh, solo artists, uh, multi-instrumentalists, and you're perhaps telling them, you know, if you're a producer or whatever, you're, you're asking them to play a particular part. If you've got a guitarist, get him to play the bass, you know, because <laughs> you can tell them, you know, ask them, you know, I want it all on one string. Where a real, real bass player is going, no, 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 that's not the way to do it. No, 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 you, you do it like this so it looks like I'm not doing anything. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and you're not going to understand. And of course, they're they're right, but they're wrong. Yeah. You know, when you when you want that, um, and then you've got the instrument because some instruments can give you that feel of the strings having the same tonal character on the bass. You know that Hofner, the the E and the A are, are closer. Well, it's more sound, similar. But it's more because the, the E isn't as much as it is that the A is more. Right. You know, so they're more balanced. It's a different instrument. So, and it's more acoustic than solid as well, which again, gives a whole nother thing. But if you just, because it's worth it, I would work out a bass part and then work out playing it all on the one string, and just see how wonderful that is. Yeah, I, I love exploring those things, and I really remember discovering some of that stuff. Um, and to me, when I look at the guitar part or the bass part, I think about, this is a great thing. What are the, what are the five different ways that we could do the same thing, you know? And how fast can we explore those to discover which tone is best and which works you know, where the problems are and stuff like that. But it, it can be a challenge trying to ask somebody else who's not 
used to that to go explore all these things. Yeah, that's why I say have a guitar player play the bass. You know, because you can say, can you move your right hand back a bit? You know? <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, because it's no tone. I'm going after the tone of the yeah, E string. Yeah, yeah. Because just that one E string doesn't have one sound. It has the left hand and the right hand sound too, and everything in between. Yeah. So it's just wonderful. And then you realize you don't need to do anything technically to get a great bass sound because there it is. And then the quest is how do you get that when you when the required part does have to be within two inches, you know, within the width of a hand. Right. Then how do you get that to sound good? You know, and again, you go back to the player. You know, I'm getting, you're playing that G and it's blowing the speakers, you know. Or whatever, you know, because yeah, they or like, it's, or it's got like a massive mid range. Just happens to fall on the fall on the one, you know, as well. You know, it's like no, 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 no. Yes, uh, and sometimes you don't hear the imbalance because the imbalance is the bright balance, because it falls on the one, because it's coinciding with a kick drum. It needs to be a bit louder, right? They're doing the right thing. Um, how about uh, empowering the bass player with the ability to hear what their subtleties are doing? to the sound. Um, I, you know, you can have somebody who's out in a pair of headphones. You can have somebody in a control room hearing their bass play back through the monitors. Any thoughts about all that? I think that's one of those yin yang things. You're either lucky enough to have somebody playing that knows the nuances and compromises of being in the studio and using headphones. Or you don't. So you're either communicating with somebody that, you know, preaching to the choir, or you've got somebody that needs to be educated from ground up, you know. Um, and then the circumstances and time available dictates that, of course, that and, and getting it for the first time in the mix are the times you have to resort to methods of changing well, the bass. Let's assume for a minute that we're, we're, Talking to people who've got who time isn't mm -hmm. the issue so much, you know, we can we can put the time into getting it right. How would you um, how would you tell an engineer to recognize when somebody's um, missing those subtleties in the headphones when you're in, when you're hearing it in the control room and the bass sounds like X? What what indicates that that bass okay. player is not hearing if it correctly? If we exclude in the headphones? timing and note choice from from this. Uh, so whatever they're doing wrong, they're doing in time, and it's the right note, right? So you say, how are your cans? Can you hear yourself well enough? The answer's going to be no, because really all they want is themselves. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm fine. And then depending on the person and the circumstance, you say, could you be a bit more aware of what I'm hearing in here, what I'm getting in here? which is not your fault, but I'd like you to compensate for. Right. If you wouldn't mind, you compensate for my shortcomings in listening <laughs> by not being so heavy on the E string. Or, you know, uh, not being so, uh, being a bit tighter, you know, like almost as if you were moving your hand a bit nearer the, the fretboard. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of like, because the guy might not even know that. He might have just right, might always played it. it. Yeah. Or he might have always played the bass with his hand resting there mm -hmm. and never bothered going any further. You know, but slight dampening, like, oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, or if you're in real trouble and the guy's a complete idiot, you say, have you got a pick? Yeah. And uh, that will force them to really rethink what they're doing. Yeah, that's true. You just you take people out of their comfort zone. Sometimes that's the right move. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've also noticed with a bass player who's not really hearing it clearly in the headphones is that sometimes there's a tendency to dig in too hard and it's just crapping out. It's just, you know, fuzzing and stuff. You know, you turn it way up in the studio speakers and all of a sudden you can't do that because it's clearly too loud in the control room or something. Yeah, you know? but somebody that's playing like that, unfortunately, is going to be responding throughout the whole song. So when it goes to the cutback of acoustic and vocal and bass, this, 
they're not going to be playing like that anymore. You know, so any consistency you had that you could correct isn't going to work. You know, you've, you've now got two base parts, to con- two errors to, compa- to, con- right. to deal with, to contend with. And, uh, you know, instead of going from one good sound to a version of that good sound, as most bass players would, they're going from some something that's wrong to something that's even more inappropriate. Right. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. What about on the mixing side? You you receive a bass. Um, you don't like it. Well, I don't know. We could start with a you don't like it sound. We could start with the you do like it. You think it was you think it was pretty good, but you're still wanting to get it to you know really sit in the mix great. You know, a lot of times we want the mix to have a great big fat low end. Okay, but uh, but one of the struggles too is you know you turn that speaker down. You're like I don't okay. e- I don't really right. hear it on the little. So speaker. we're back to a one K, but it's in the bass guitars world is 700 cycles okay um experiment with 700 cycles now that will that's the voice that's the diction if you like of the bass guitar yeah how well you can understand it uh volume obviously is how well you're gonna chance to hear it but how well you can understand it's going to be 700 cycles um the other way to hear the bass and to perhaps give it a different attitude is to reamp it uh, even if it's an amp don't be afraid of the fact that you don't have a di so you can't reamp it that's that's a rule that doesn't apply you know an amp can go into an amp they do we have things called preamps that go into amps. The word amp belongs to both of them. So we just treat it as your preamp and go into another one. So you're saying um, our first question might have been like, oh, but we don't have the we don't have the DI recorded, so mm-hmm. how can we reamp it? You're saying even if it's an amp track, just run that back through another sure. amp. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Treat your original one that you don't like as the DI, if you like. And in fact, you're in a better world because very typically... No one's done anything about the fact that the amp and the DI aren't in time with each right, other. Right, right. You know, again, in this digital world, that should be a no-brainer. You know, you might have a few milliseconds of delay on the amp compared to the DI. You need to fix that pronto. Right. That get is them in phase massive, together, yeah. That is a massive, get them in time. Um, some of the ways that I try and do that are, if I can, I... If I'm lucky enough to ask somebody to give me like a tick, tick, tick sound or something on the bass, something's very muted that just gives me a spike, then I might be able to measure the sample delay in Pro Tools and shift the DI back in time to, to be closer to the amp. Do you just use click to transient? That will find it for you. Oh, you're saying just use the tra- click to transient. So, but But sometimes the notes that begin and, you know, the same bass note on the screen between the DI and the amp, they look quite different at the waveform level. Well, um, they're going to be massively different, i.e. 180 degrees different. If you zoom right in using a click to transient, you're going to be within, you know, let's say a typical screen, you're going to be within six inches of where they start. Roughly. Right, right. Maybe not, maybe a foot, whatever. But you're going to see. Now, if you've got a, two very similar looking waveforms 
one then you're lucky. Yeah, but one raggedy and one not. But you're going to see their their general curve. Mm -hmm. And if one's going up and the other's going down, one of them's out of phase. Right. Yeah. And usually the one that, well, don't quote me on this, but try this. Try, <laughs> I like, I like that. try tempting, <laughs> try, try assuming that the one going up first is the right one. <laughs> it's nothing like recording your voice on a podcast to not quote you, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let, let, for argument's sake, use the one that goes up first as the one that's in phase. Right, right. <laughs> and then shift accordingly and then move them in sync with each other. Um, as much as you can, sorry to say this, but see. And uh, then you can put your nudge thing on the smallest increment possible and listen. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to help qualify that. So Rockstars, if you took the the track that you're getting ready to move around and you just select that whole region in Pro Tools, then the nudge button should let you plus and minus up and down and it's going to ship that region even while you're playing the bass yeah. and listen and hearing yeah. it back. And depending on the power of your system and what the system's being asked to do will determine how soon you hear that change. Right, because it might be a momentary delay. There might be a delay. So you, you know, you might want to take that into consideration. It, the world isn't as instantaneous as you'd like it to be. So, and then I'll also qualify this in, in saying like another option that I try sometimes is I'll put the time adjuster plug in on the DI and then I'll adjust the samples going up and down because you can hold the arrow key to do that. Mm -hmm. But in my version, I haven't actually corrected the audio tracks so that they're committed that way. And in the version Richard's describing, you know, by actually shifting the audio on the screen, when you're done, you're done, you know, your bass is in, lined up and it's never going to get screwed up again. So there's a lot of value to make committing that, you know, either placement way of works the audio. for me. I mean, what your method chooses to do is to make the DI late. Right. Good point. Right. However, the argument could be made, but we're listening to what's coming out the speaker. Maybe. Which is many, many milliseconds later. You know, however, there was in on headphones. So should we only really compensate for the distance between the driver and the ear? You know, how many, what's that, half a millisecond? Um, but it's all a matter of time. And these are moot points because once you've got that bass sound locked in, you make you gang those two tracks. You know, you've got your balance amp to DI, you've got the timing amp to like just lock them, treat it as one. Yeah. Hide one of them if you like. You know? Yeah. It's funny how there are some timing issues in music where where if something gets if the timing of something gets messed with, you hear it and you feel it. And then there are other ones where you're like, that subtle thing, it doesn't even matter. It's like Yeah. You know, um, it, talking about bass, which is not really a prime topic of mixing, but if you've got a good bass player, or a, or even if it's a created part, which I'm, I'm, we're talking so much about musicians and performers, and there's so much less of what goes on today. If you have a part, a bass part that is, uh, if you've got a bass part that is is really good. Then hang your hat on it, you know. Uh, in the in the world of performance, a great bass player is where the song is, where the time is, where one is. A bass player is gauged, as far as I'm concerned, on where they know how well they know where one is. Right. You know, because that frees up a really great drummer to. To be a little bit more expressive yeah, or something. Yeah, and, and to, to set the groove, you know. Uh, and the two of them together is the total foundation of the whole thing. Everything else from then on is icing on the cake, you know. Yeah, I feel like in, in this day and age of so easily being able to build a song up one piece at a time, it's so important to get that drum and bass part right. Um before you start adding those overdubs because yeah. you're kind of screwed if you don't. However, at the same time, I'm always struck by the times where I track a band, I, maybe I'm playing guitar on it and we, we play together and the interpretation of the center of the timing is, is, you know, in the ears of the band when it happens. And like, it feels just right to me. Mm -hmm. 
But if I just soloed one of those drums or something like that, I might have been like, oh, we better break out that terrible tool for affecting all the timing of the drums to try and get this straightened out. And it's a really tricky balance. Yeah, it's, it is. Your option is to say, he's right, or she, I should say. The bass player is right. If I'm not with the bass player, I'm wrong. Right. Unless the bass player is wrong. In which case, go get the click out, you know, and you can move the bass later. Yeah. Um, you know, having said that, you, you have a good band working with a click. Uh, they're not going to be always with the click. What do you do? When you get little scientists and you want it to be really, really great, mm -hmm. something's not right. You know, the bass player is a bit off with a click and the drummer's a bit off with a click. Where do you go? The temptation is to move them both to the click. Yeah? Maybe not. Maybe, depending on what he's playing, move the bass to the, to the kick. Move the kick to the bass. Mm -hmm. And let the click be history. Because you know, everything that comes after that may not be playing to the click. They may be playing to their interpretation of the bass and drum sound that they get. Mm -hmm. you know, so make Nobody's going to hear the click in the final mix unless you made a real mistake. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've often preferred it with the click in. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man, click, click tracks and tempos, it's such a whole other topic too. Um, Steve Albini had a great quote, which is he said, I think he said, I've never... I'm not aware of any song I ever didn't like because it wasn't recorded to a click track. Right. Like, I don't think there was a song I ever didn't like because it wasn't recorded to a click track. I think the meaning, too, is like if he didn't like a song, it's because he didn't like the song. Yeah, well, he's 100% correct. Um, it's not unusual. But it's... Uh, yeah, I'm just playing devil's advocate. I wonder how much more I would have liked it if it was in tune, in time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a good point. It's, um, but I get his point and I agree with him. Well, so it, it kind of brings me full circle too. You're talking about like, you know, the bass player is right. I'm going to take that a step further and I'm going to say the listener is right. I'm going to mm -hmm. suggest that, you know, who's listening to the completion of all this music and the mix is ultimately right. Um, because if it doesn't connect with that listener, it's none of it matters. And I guess when you're mixing, you're the listener. So, you know, we, we learn to trust ourselves and trust how we feel about it as we're yeah, working on it. but we're not unbiased as listeners. Right. Um, sometimes we hear what we want to hear because we love the artist and they're playing their own song and it's a terrible version of it. But we might still love it because it's them. Right. And we put it down to the fact that it's somebody else's fault. It's the TV, it's the mixer, it's the band, it's whatever it is, but it's not the real reason. The artist sucked, you know, and they actually always suck, except in the studio. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's funny that. Though. Some people just aren't live, you know. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> so it's a great thing. Uh, that whole whole deal, but we're studio guys. Yeah, we are, and, and and we love mixing. Yeah, and we have all these facilities that the live guys don't yet have. I have to put that word "yet" now in because I couldn't believe I would actually endure. Well, I don't endorse, but I'm grateful to Isotope mm -hmm. for some of their plugins. You know, only as, as far as I know, only they have. Um, it's uh, it's a cool thing to be able to raise the vo vocal at the mastering stage. At the mastering. Oh, stage. you're talking about Ozone Nine. That that just came across my radar too. So I haven't ex experimented with it yet, but I know they're doing some clever stuff. Holy shit! It's that's something worth saving up for. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I well, know. very cool. Yeah, I, I'm really amazed at um, the tools that those guys are making. Uh, I recently have been um, using the song capturing 
tool, the, the Spire Studio. Oh, yeah. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's just like I'm just sketching songs and then I record it. And, and um, once it's on my phone, I could start a song and then I just text it over to my buddy who's in another city. And he opens it up on his phone and he can add the overdub and text it to the other buddy. And they can add it and send it back. And you can export the multi-tracks. And the funny thing about it is it really, like there's some little secret sauce going on under the hood that really does sound better than if I'm using like, you know, the other typical apps on my phone to record the same idea. That's great. Um, I, and I haven't experienced it, but based on what I have experienced from that company, I'm fully prepared to accept verbatim what you said. You yeah. Know, as it's just because I know the hoops I've jumped through to try and do, what I can now automate on a plugin. Right. I Someone sent me, one of the most recent projects I got was a live recording from Straight to That, which was a digital tape recording system, straight to stereo. And the balance wasn't good. Mm -hmm. By the time I'd finished with it, it's brilliant. (laughs) 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 It's really, I mean, it's just, um, and that's where we are now. So who knows, you know, um, what's next? I did not believe, I mean, there are some elements of some of the plugins, and I'm not just saying that one manufacturer, where they do the function as advertised, but the cost, you know, removing a bark, a dog bark from a classical performance, yes, you can. Right. The end result sounds awful, Mm. but the bark's gone. Right. You know, that's... That's a different sort of plugin. But when you can just say, turn the drums up, and magically the drums get louder. Oh, that's fun. I'm looking forward to exploring that. You know, um, it's fun. I'm trying to work out how to get the plugin that they show on the website as opposed to the one I've got. You know, the one I've got comes uh, with three elements. You can choose one of three elements, bass, drums, vocal. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've got to. But the one they, I see on the website has four elements, like has everything else. Yeah. Ooh, well, maybe it's <laughs> it coming. Has, you has know. transients instead of drums. It has, uh, you know, so I imagine that's part of another package. Well, um, there's another element in there that's been around for a long time, but it's one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Um, there's a tape emulator in there too, and obviously we have a whole suite of tape emulations in digital plug-in land. Mm-hmm. Um, you've worked with tape. Mm-hmm. You've worked with digital. Uh, what do you want to say about some of these tape plugins? Uh, and, you know, how useful are they? Where are some places that we might benefit from exploring? Do you ever put a tape plug-in right across the two mix and start mixing that way? Yes. But my, my advice is to um, audition them all and pick one or two that you like, buy them, and then forget their tape machines. Right. Don't, don't use them as tape machines. No one ever liked tape machines anyway. You know. We couldn't I, wait for digital, right? No, I couldn't wait for nothing. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's being in the control room. I, I've got a feeling I'm repeating myself, but be the only person in the control room with the band's rocking in the studio and thinking, shit, the first time they hear it, it's going to be off tape. You know, why can't they hear this? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's that reminder that you are the only person in the world that experienced all those records you did in input. Mm -hmm. Well, the band, when they were out there recording it, but you were the one in the control room. Yeah, and that brings me, can I just put this thing that kills me? You go to some wonderful studios locally and internationally that have the, the best examples of some really classic, analog equipment and they're drooling over it and no one's hearing it because the method they use is to go through the A to D, D to A before they hear anything. Right. You know, for convenience, like we went through input on the tape machine. Mm -hmm. Our path wasn't pure either, but it was analog. Right. Now it's digital. So you've got these wonderful microphones going through these wonderful old like it compressors. Sounds, you're saying it kind of sounds like crap by the time it gets to your speakers well, it's anyway. it's certainly not analog. Yeah. It's well, it's analog because it's coming out of speakers, but I mean, it's been en route. It's been digitized. Yep. It's gone through two changes. 
to digital and back to analog, which is a shame, especially when there's a full console in front of you, you know, where you could, if you went to the effort, actually be listening to the output of the console and have to switch a switch to hear the output of the Pro Tools, you know. Likely, but yes. what do you do? I mean, in the end, you got to capture it and, and play it back somehow. So yeah, but what I'm saying is is that uh, to drool over, you know, how analog this is when you're not even listening to analog. Right, right, is a bit weird. Well, so my experience down at the Bonnaroo Hay Bale Studio, uh, the Hay Bale Studio, and then some of the sessions I've done with my own band. Um, if I go way back, we did one where we were all playing live. It was just a Mackie console and some outboard gear. And the only thing I had to record onto was a DAP machine. But all the stuff got recorded analog until it finally, as a two-track, got printed to the DAP machine. And I remember just being really struck by the the clarity and like the, you know, how good it sounded to me to record that way. And then at Bonnaroo, I did that for years and years where we'd go through an analog console um, and hear it some down to two tracks and then then get recorded, captured as a finished mix. More recently, I've leaned on the benefit of, because we need to do multi-tracks and do the mix, I've leaned on the benefits of using using a digital console like the PreSonus Studio Live, where it's so easy to, to, you know, and convenient to get all that, you know, and you get kind of that, you find that perfect meeting of, of what you need and what you want and all that. But there is something to be said for, you know, mixing, getting as much done in nothing but wire until it finally gets captured. And it really has a purity that that is not quite the same as when you break it out to a whole bunch of digital tracks and a DAW and then play it back afterwards. Yeah, I, um, see, hopefully digital is still evolving into something that's going to be better than it is, which is, yeah. you know, that, that's been the case Certainly, for a long time. So our grandkids are going to hear this and be like, what are you guys all complaining about? It sounds great. Yeah. Well, even more so if they don't have access to what it really sounds like, you know, in any given instance. Um, but yeah, they won't be wrong. Now, just in so much as, you know, we talk about the good old days, these are the good old days. Right. For another generation. Right. You know, it's... Um, but the, the digital thing... We've been through so many awful stages and in some cases left behind some really good stuff. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, for whatever reason, moved on. Uh, the Sony multi-track, the 24-track, horrible sounding piece of crap. However, the 24-bit version... The 48 track sounded okay. Mm-hmm. But that still had this terrible function. Whereas it seemed like every musical octave was inverse phase. <laughs> it seemed that's what it, you know, and actually when I was in Japan, I just I tested that. And I couldn't believe it. I did a tonal sweep on the device and it seemed like every octave it switched phase. Weird. Yeah, I mean, it's supposedly corrected when it's through both cycles, but a bit weird, you know. Um, but then Sony, when they came out with the PCM F1 system, which was 16-bit in Europe. Yeah, I remember that, and you could use a VHS cassette or something. To beta. Record a beta. Your yeah, beta tape, yeah. I was uh, struck by the fact there was virtually no, well, no tape noise. This was wonderful, you know, because at the time I was doing a lot of movie and TV stuff, lots of dynamics and bias sections and stuff, which analog wasn't the best <laughs> at capturing. Right. I think we um, we think of analog a lot of times for rock and roll when the dynamic, like the tape noise, is it's so down there, it's never a struggle. But as soon as you try and open wide up, uh, you know, up with the music and the production, it becomes can become a real issue. Yeah, and classical music that has lots of dynamics, you know. But uh, so I was already interested in the fact that we could achieve a good sound without all the tape rubbish that we had to put up with. And on one occasion, I had a really good 15 IPS quarter inch mix 
on uh, an ATR 102, and which I'd simultaneously, for safety, put to the F1 digital machine. And I was playing them back just to compare, just for the hell of it. And of course, as, as I did, I eventually got round to putting the mono button in. That's when I started to think, oh, what's going on? The digital blows the analog away. Interesting. I couldn't, I had to speak to some people to, and philosophize, as it were. Why? Why am I hearing that? And someone said, well, you know, it's the inaccuracy in the heads. It's the cancellation and the crosstalk and all that stuff that when you combine two analog tracks to mono, you don't get everything. The PCM stereo machine is mono. It's very rapidly recording left and then right. Hmm. So when it comes together, it's perfect. Hmm. It's actually better in mono than it is in stereo, whereas the analog is worse. Well, I think a great takeaway there, too, is just remembering the power of not taking too many things for granted. So if you've got a way of capturing some stuff, and then maybe you've got two different things you could record it onto and play it back, try them both. Yeah. Play them back. Find out which one sounds better. And may I suggest another thing, takeaway from that? Look for the good. Usually, every piece of crappy gear I've come across has something. That, that you is can good like at, yeah. about it. Yeah. I must admit, in some cases, it's the off button. <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, usually, you know, there's a sweet spot on an EQ that another EQ doesn't sound like that there. Yeah, again, a, a little friend is 1K or below. You know, where your sound is, where your tone is. You can uh, you know, have the same source and put it through different EQs, choose their version of 1K. See what, see what they sound like. Mm. Well, um, we're coming up on the closing of the episode. Is there anything we haven't talked about as far as mixing? Any important? The future? Sure, let's talk about the future of mixing. What did you call it? Immersive? Immersive audio. So one of our guests on the show, Andres Mayo, you know, we got a chance to really talk about 360 sound and, and experiencing binaural recording and things like that. Well, um, I've recently had the opportunity to experience two of the systems, um, one of which is the Dolby Atmos, and the other is the Sony, forgive me if I get this wrong, 360RA, mm -hmm. okay. Reality Audio, I believe it is. And uh, the Sony has a delivery system, which is very exciting. Uh, the Dolby has a... Uh, speaker environment which is interesting um, I fear that we're going to another situation where we have two competitive systems and uh, you, mean, in the you past, mean like Betamax and VHS? VHS I didn't say that for the fear that people not knowing what we're talking about <laughs> yeah well I think yeah but I think we <laughs> can Android, Android no uh, iOS you know yeah well that's a funny thing because so so Rockstar's Betamax and VHS were two different Competing systems, right? And Betamax was known to actually look and sound better than VHS, but VHS won and became ubiquitous because they could get more porn on it. Because they could get more porn on it. There you go. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know the full story on that. Yeah. But but um, so Betamax just sort of faded away. But then you reference Apple yeah, and but there was and a Android. third system at that time. Just to be accurate, the Philips two thousand. Okay. All right. Which was far superior to both of them, um, but you couldn't get enough time on it. And, uh, of course, then LaserDisc. Right, LaserDisc. That was the whole thing. But anyway, this is way off the thing. Audio. Um, mind you, all those systems required audio. Mm -hmm. And the VHS actually implemented FM audio onto the tape as well. So they, they made a, an effort to improve the, 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 the sound, as it were. But, um, yeah, the, uh, the immersive audio... I, uh, my experience so far is I think Sony, if they decide to continue and compete, as it were, probably have the delivery system of all. 
literally you'll be able to they they have a system you know, I don't know how much is public and how much is not but uh, they can actually personalize the experience we talked about that with Andres we talked about um, the importance of the head transfer function which means that each of our heads are a different shape so therefore we each experience a different version of what sounds correct in three-dimensional audio and he said down the road it will be as simple as you you take your phone and you hold it back and it's going to scan your head and you're going to have your own profile and you put your headphones in and everybody's going to experience a similar three-dimensionality because it's tailored to your yeah. listening experience. Very much as I'm just creating this in my mind, formulating this in my mind right now, but it's it will be an audio spectacle, as in glasses. <laughs> you know, right, right. Good point, yeah. You're going to have... Uh, the, the uh, audio optician. I know that's not right, but uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, I actually very quickly had that uh, experience and I can't believe the difference it makes. That's fascinating. You know, um, another little tip, just as a parting shot, if you like, uh, to improve your monitoring environment and your mixes and everything else, use your hands behind your ears to help you focus and hear all that your environment has to give you. Um, and that's effectively what the Sony thing did for me. So you mean cup your hands yeah. behind your ears so you're yeah. sort don't, of listening to don't, don't touch your ears. Just put them there as you're talking. I mean, just do it now as you're talking and you won't believe what you can do with just hey, 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 yeah. Everything sounds different. Yeah. Can yeah, you hear it on the microphone, Roxas? I'm thinking maybe not. Not by the time I... Uh, squash this in a mix. I wouldn't be surprised if they can. <laughs> if they, well, if they can't. But uh, yeah, I mean, at least uh, the, the, the microphone you've given me to use is mono. Why is yep. that? Um, I don't think Mike Tech makes a PM9 that's stereo yet. That's why. No, I mean, I just, why? I don't think I need a stereo mic for recording a voice. We could have cut this whole program down just to that. <laughs> yeah, just to one mic. <laughs> just to, why do I need more than one mic? Right. <laughs> right. There you go. Um, yeah, well, speaking of which, the thing that I'm always struck by is just how focused a sound is when you start putting your, you know, the entirety of your instrument into a single mic. It just, I always feel like, well, that sounds right. You know, or if it doesn't, let's move the mic and play the instrument differently or something. Yeah, if you want another opinion on your mix, record it. Stick a mic up, record your mix, and then listen to that. See what that sounds like. It's an interesting thought. You know, I mean, because that's basically a lot of mixing is confidence. And you've either got somebody there telling you how great it is because they know that's what you want to hear, or you've got someone telling you that you're crap. And that's usually your own inner, right. Inner, right. inner being doing that, you know. So uh, I'm like that all the time. I'm never satisfied with... with I. I know that I can do better. Yeah, why work with people that don't like your work when you have enough of that coming from inside? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I don't like it more than they don't like it. There you go. Anyway. You can't dislike I'm much this better more than at, me. Much better at not liking what I do than they are. <laughs> well, very cool. Well, Richard, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us again. Anytime. Absolute pleasure hanging out with you. Um, where should everybody go listen to more of your work? Where can they go find you online? and um, The internet. The internet. All right. Richard Dodd, D O D D dot com. Yeah, I believe. But they won't get much from there. I have no audio samples up there. Okay. And uh, I think it was last updated in 2012. Now, I do have a question for you. I went to Discogs mm -hmm. um, and to go look at your discography, and then they have a, a category that's vast that's just called like technical or something. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea what that means? And is that, does that mean that, that um, those are credits that would be mixes or? How do we? Sometimes I don't know how to interpret those discography websites and what their definitions are of the contributions on records. Uh, all I know that on all music, um, you'll often find two people on the same category. Okay. And my name is one of those. All right, good enough. Along with another very talented Englishman called, sorry, along with a talented Englishman called Richard Dodd, uh, I think he has a middle initial A, and he plays cello primarily. Oh, right on. Cool. And uh, so sometimes you'll see 
his credits appear on my all music guide thing. Yeah. Well, I, I still think it's great that we have these online places to find stuff. Even yeah. with their imperfections, what's a lot disgusting of stuff is thing. the fact that the record companies, the owners of the, make no effort to include credits anywhere. Yeah, where they when they can, it's too easy. They can put an ISRC code on a thing, and a title. They can put the credits there too, right? Or at least a link to the credits. Yeah. Well, hopefully that, hopefully uh, momentum will introduce a solution to that for us in the future. No, not less there's money in it. Yeah. If someone can monetize, which maybe all music has, you know, and monetize the credit system, then it will be there. All right, there you go, rock stars. Figure out how to monetize the credit system and we'll find a solution. Um, Richard, thanks for being on the show. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. All right, cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lyd Shaw and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Thanks so much for listening to this episode, Rockstars. I also want to give a big thank you to our sponsors who help make this episode possible. OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things that I highly recommend you check out for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Cheers.